morning and welcome to the joint Sunday worship for St. Albans and St. Thaddeus. I'm glad you were able to make it today and I wish we could be worshiping in person, but we're not quite ready for that yet. But just know in the meantime that your presence makes this a holy time and a holy space. I hope you enjoy our worship today and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you.
we're going to focus on the epiphany light and specifically recognizing what Christ is doing in the world around us. And we're going to invite people from the community who are doing Jesus work and different things to come and speak. Justice, justice is a process. You know, people don't realize that there are children that uh, actually live on the street. The, the arrest mechanism in law enforcement is absolutely the end um, epiphany result. of recognizing what Christ is up to in our community. Hi, this is Courtney Hicks, and I have been given the honor of being the Senior Warden for St. Thaddeus for this year. I want to welcome you to the service this morning and let you know how much I miss us being able to get together and do these services in person so that we can greet each other, pray together, give those wonderful hugs that I love to give and to give. So um, until we are able to meet in person again, be safe and take care of one another. Thanks so much for your time. Good morning and welcome to Eucharist here at St. Albans with St. Thaddeus. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Just want to say a quick reminder that um, you can participate as little as you want in this service. Uh, your presence is what makes it holy. So thank you for being among us. Blessed be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilad. Elijah said to Elijah, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elijah, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elijah, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elijah said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Hello, friends. So we like to tell stories about the people of God. And if you remember, a lot of the stories about the people of God happen in the desert. And the desert is an interesting place. At night, it gets real cold in the desert. But during the day, it's very hot, and the wind blows, and it changes the sand. And so you can get lost in the desert. There's not a lot of water to drink and not a lot of food to eat. The desert can be a dangerous place. We remember that after the Great Flood, All the creatures of the earth went into the great four directions and began to fill up the earth. And a lot of them would settle where there was water. And in this place where our story happens, there are two great rivers. And at that time, there was a city called Ur and another one called Haran. Now, the people in Ur, they believed in 
many gods. There were gods for everything. There was gods for the water and for the fish. There were gods for the air and the moon and the stars. There were gods for the birds. The world was alive with gods. But there was a family in Ur. The father was Abram and the mother was Sarai. And that family believed that all of God was in everything. They weren't sure if that was true, but they believed it. And that's how they knew they needed to leave Ur and set out on a journey. And so one night, when God called them out, they gathered their friends and their animals and their helpers, and they left. And they set out into the desert. And as they went, they followed the great river Euphrates. And at night, they would camp on its banks. They would use the water to cook food and to drink. And it guided their way. And it was a really long journey. They were really tired, but they knew they were getting close when there were other people on the road. And finally, one day, they arrived at Haran and took their rest. Abram, sometimes at night, he would go out into the desert. And he would look out at all the grains of sand. And he would look up and see all the stars in the sky. And God would come so close to Abram, and Abram would feel so close to God that Abram knew what God wanted him to do. And that's how he knew that he and Sarai, they couldn't stay in Haran. That their journey needed to continue. And so again, they gathered their friends and their helpers. Abram's brother-in-law, Lot, went with them this time, and they did not have the water to guide them, but they set out into the journey. As they journeyed on, they came to a place called Shekim, and there they climbed the hill. And on the top of the hill, they prayed, and they knew that the God that was there in Ur and in Haran was here too. And so to celebrate that, they built an altar. But they knew that God did not want them to stay. Their journey needed to continue. So they walked on. They stopped at a place named Bethel. And in Bethel, again, they prayed. And they noticed that in Bethel, that the God that was in Ur and Haran and at Shekim, that all of God was everywhere. And so they celebrated by building another altar. But this is not where God wanted them to stay. Eventually, they came to a place and they pitched their tents under the oaks of Mamre. And there in Hebron, that's where they knew God wanted them to stay. And Abram was called out into the desert one night. And as he looked out at all the grains of sand and looked up at all the stars in the sky, God came very close. And Abram felt very close to God. And God said to Abram, you are going to be a part, the father of a great family. Now, Abram thought, 
This could not be. He and Sarai were so old. But God said it would be. And God also said that Abram was to change his name to Abraham and Sarai was to change her name to Sarah. Now, time passed. And there were no children. But one day, three visitors came out of the desert. And Abraham, seeing them coming, ran and greeted them. He invited them back to where he and Sarah had their tent. And Sarah, she prepared for them cakes. She used three measures of flour. Now, that's a lot. She was very generous. And they had meat and milk and cakes to eat. And the three strangers, they told Abraham that he and Sarah would have a son. And Abraham laughed. And Sarah, she laughed too. They were, they were so old. But the three said it would be so. And do you know what happened? They had a baby. And when he was born, they laughed and they were so happy that they named him Isaac, which in their language means laughter. And Isaac grew to be a fine young man. Now, Sarah, so old and full of years, died. And Abraham and Isaac buried her under the oaks of Mamre. Now, Isaac and Abraham were sad and Abraham was lonely, but Abraham knew that there was one last thing that he needed to do before he died. And so he sent one of his helpers back to Haran, where they had friends and family so that the helper could find a wife for Isaac. And so the helper, the best of all the helpers, journeyed on. And one night he was outside of Hebron at a well, and a woman came, and she helped him feed his animals. Her name was Rebecca, and she invited the helper back to her home, and there they had dinner together, and Rebecca told the helper about her family, and the helper told Rebecca all about Isaac and Abraham and Sarah and the great family. And somehow Rebecca knew, because she was courageous and strong, that she was a part of the great family. And so she set out on her own journey. And when Isaac saw her coming, he greeted her. Time passed and Abraham, so old and full of years, died. And Isaac and Rebekah buried him with Sarah under the oaks of Mambre. Now, Isaac and Rebekah had children, and those children had children, and those children had children. And this went on for generation after generation until one day your grandparents were born. And they grew up and they had children, and those children had children, and you were born. And that's how you became a part of the great family of God, which is as many as the stars in the sky, and as many as the grains of sand in the desert. 
Now I wonder, what is your favorite part of the story? I wonder who you are in this story. I wonder if there was anything here that we could take away and still have everything that we need. All right, friends, until next time, I'll see you again. the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So in the name of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I don't think I've ever done this before, but I'm going to attempt to start this with kind of a joke. And it's not original from me. It's one that I read about, so I can't take credit for it if you like it. Or actually, I can't take credit for it if you don't like it either. But it's about a PhD student who was studying at SMU, Southern Methodist University. 
And this PhD student was a bit on the evangelical side. So one day he was in the student cafeteria, he was eating lunch and he was reading a text and another student approached. <clears throat> and the other student said, have you found Jesus? And without missing a beat, without looking up from his meal or his book, the PhD student said, why? Have you lost him again? <laughs> so that's about the best I can do with jokes <laughs> and humor and so on. So today is a very interesting day. This is the last Sunday in the Epiphany. It is also called Transfiguration Sunday, which is not the same as the Feast of the Transfiguration because that feast day is on August the 6th. This is also Valentine's Day, not to be confused with St. Valentine's Day. St. Valentine came off of the Roman Catholic registry of saints in 1969 because they concluded they didn't have enough information on him to actually do whatever they have to do to keep him a saint. However, the Anglican and Lutheran churches decided to hang on to him, so they celebrate his feast day today, except we're not doing that today. And then we have this thing called Valentine's, and Valentine's themselves originated in 18th century England when printers began printing short verses on cards. Young men who were trying to woo their women um, bought these cards. They became very popular, and so today we have these things that are called Valentine's. They're not called Saint Valentine's, they're Valentine's. So we have the secular, we have the religious, and so today is one of those sort of interesting days where all these things seem to come together. And so one of the things that we could actually refer to today as is the day of the great reveal, the great reveal, because this is the day on which Jesus is transfigured. So as we, as we journey with the disciples, or at least with three of the disciples, the three from the inner circle, with Jesus up the mountain, what happens is we see the real Jesus as he appears in heaven, as he is in heaven. This is one of those moments that is, is just phenomenal for the disciples. They're not really sure what to do with it. So what we do next, what we do next in our church calendar is we move into Lent, and we do that this Wednesday with ashes. And in Lent, what we do is we walk with Jesus, and we cry with Jesus as he moves towards death on the cross in Jerusalem. And then after that, we can celebrate with Jesus. We can't celebrate with him until we move through the sadness and the tears. So today, actually in our reading, this is the beginning of it. Today, Jesus begins to set his face towards Jerusalem. But before he does that, he goes up the mountain. So when we, when we look at this passage in Mark, it appears or it occurs in the ninth chapter. We're smack dab in the middle of the gospel of Mark. Everything up to this point has been fast-paced. We've seen Jesus emerge, be announced, be baptized, and then he starts healing, and he starts teaching, and he starts casting out demons. He calls his disciples. And then just before this particular point in the gospel, he has been teaching and preaching to crowds that have gathered and followed him, and so he turns to his disciples and he asks them the question, who do they say that I am? And the disciples reply, well, some say you're Moses. Some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking for the disciples, says, you are the Messiah, which is an amazing statement of faith. And then, right then, Jesus begins teaching about what he must 
undergo the pain, the suffering, and the death. And Peter just can't stand that because that doesn't fit with his image of the Messiah. So he says to Jesus, don't, don't talk like that. You can't speak like that. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Six days later, we get to today's gospel, where Jesus takes Peter, James, John, with him up the mountain. And as we read it in Mark's gospel, it takes a total of seven verses for them to start at the bottom of the mountain, go to however up, whatever level on the mountain they're going to, go through this process of we refer to as the transfiguration, and then descend the mountain. Mark makes it sound like it's an incredibly rapid process. But the mountain that they went up, we think was Mount Hebron, which has an elevation of more than 6,000 feet. That is a lot of elevation to climb. And what we know is that even if they just went partway up the mountain, it would, it would not be a 10 or 15 or 20 minute trek. If they went most of the way up the mountain, stayed for the transfiguration as they did, and then descended the mountain, at the very, very least, it would be an all day affair. My hunch is it might be more than that. Mark doesn't tell us. So as they go up, I don't know if you've ever climbed a mountain. 6,000 foot peak is daunting to say the least. Um, the highest mountain in this area is Big Frog Mountain in this area. It's about, I can't remember the exact elevation, something like 3,300 feet. And when you get to the top of it, you're fairly fatigued. So 6,000 feet, I've never done 6,000 feet except on a cog rail, and that took an hour or so. So the disciples are up there. They're on the mountain with Jesus, and they have to be hungry. They have to be tired. They have to be thirsty. And they look, and they see Jesus transfigured, bright, white, his glory, the glory that we will see uh, of him, or his glory that we'll see when he's in heaven, is revealed to them. And then with him appears Moses and Elijah. Moses is known as the lawgiver. Elijah is one of the major prophets or the major prophet. And so we see Jesus with the law and the prophets gathered in this one place. And Moses and Elijah are talking with Jesus. And yet Mark doesn't tell us that Jesus says anything. In fact, the only person that says anything at that point is Peter. Peter seems uncomfortable with this kind of silence. And Peter is fairly impulsive, as we know. And so he blurts out, gee, maybe we should have this building project. And again, Mark doesn't give us any idea as to whether the other disciples had anything to do with it or whether Jesus even responded to it. What we do know is that right about that time, at least in this story, a cloud descends. And from that cloud comes this voice, God's voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then the cloud lifts, and Jesus is alone, looking like Jesus looked before they ascended the mountain. So I don't know if you've ever been in a fog on a mountain. I suspect many of you have, and most of you who have been in fogs or descended clouds have done so when you're driving. But I'm wondering if you've ever been in a fog or a cloud like that on foot. I have. And in fact, one of the times that I was in such a cloud, and it was a cloud, was on Big Frog Mountain as I was ascending Big Frog Mountain. So most of the trail, it's a well-marked trail, but most of the trail at Big Frog Mountain is fairly narrow, um, and you can't really stray off the trail. 
on one side you kind of go straight down and on the other side it's pretty steep up so the trail is sort of on the side of the mountain most of the way going up and so as i entered that cloud it was an amazing an amazing experience it was damp but it was it, it was like being in a in a separate universe it became very thick couldn't hear anything else. It was as though I was the only person in the universe. Huh. It, was, it was one of those amazing experiences. And I imagine that this was the kind of experience that the disciples had when the cloud descended. And again, on mountains, clouds can do that. They'll kind of move along and it feels like they're descending. I don't know that they're really descending. I think they're just being pushed along but they encounter the mountain. And if you're there when they encounter it, then it's going to feel like the cloud descended on you. So when I read or I try to imagine what it would have been like to be one of those disciples on the mountain with Jesus, with the cloud, it's, it must have been uh, almost, I don't, I don't even have a good term for it, maybe a little bit eerie, certainly odd, certainly out of their experience. It would have had special meaning. And then for a voice to speak from the cloud, if I had been there, I think it would have terrified me. I assume it terrified them. So what we see when they're on the mountain, before the cloud descends, we see Jesus in his glory. All the earthly pieces are pretty much stripped away, and they see him as they will see him in glory. So in revealing himself to us that way, he reveals himself to them. They get a glimpse. They don't know the, the rest of the story yet, so they don't really have a way of making sense out of it. They know what they've seen or they know what they think they've seen. In addition to that, they've been with Jesus as he heals, as he teaches, as he preaches, as he casts out demons. So they've seen all of this but it's not making a whole lot of sense to them because their notion of the Messiah is pretty much like everybody else's notion, and that is that the Messiah is going to be a military leader who comes in to free them from the oppression of the Romans. And that's not Jesus' Messiahship. And that's what Jesus keeps trying to teach them and tell them. In that mountaintop experience, in that mountaintop experience, God is revealed to them. It's kind of hard for them to digest, but God is revealed to them. And as we read this part in the gospel, God is revealed to us. God is revealed to us. And in listening to him and listening to God, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. In listening to him, we find that we're called to do those things that He's called us to do. We find ourselves feeding the hungry, feeding those whom Jesus calls his own. We find ourselves clothing the naked, those whom Jesus calls his own. We find us visiting the sick. We find us visiting the prisoners. We find us comforting those who feel alone, who feel lost. We do those things. We, we, we attend to those who are frightened because Jesus calls us to do that. So we ascend the mountain with the disciples. We encounter Jesus in his glory. We hear the voice tell us, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And we find ourselves responding to that call. Take care of my people. Take care of my sheep. So we find Jesus even in the fog of a mountain, even in the fog of a mountain. And when we find Jesus, we're called to share him. Amen. Amen.
We affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and the kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the joy of the revelation of God's new light in the world, let us pray to God, saying, Receive our prayer. God who ordains, become manifest in the work of your ministers in this and every church, so that through the priesthood of all believers, your name and countenance may be made known, your love revealed, and your saving promise embraced by all. God of the new light. Receive our prayer. God who commands, give discerning and prayerful hearts to those who govern and hold authority throughout the world. From the ashes of oppression and injustice, give rise to your created purpose by which your demand to love will be better realized throughout the world. God of the new light. Receive our prayer. God who gathers, enfold this parish community and the greater church community in loving mutuality. For there is discord, help its members to resurrect unity, that we may better participate in the kingdom brought about by your self-disclosure. We pray especially for Church of the Good Shepherd in Knoxville. We pray for all those communities of faith. God of the new light. Receive our prayer. God who restores, hold in your embrace all those who in this community are facing trouble, illness, our despair. We especially pray for Christopher, for Philip, for John Treber, for Brad and his mother. Help us all to see frailty, fatigue, failure, and disappointment as opportunities to depend more deeply on your love. God of the new life. Receive our prayer. God who gives birth, lead us and all people to participate in the rejuvenation and resurrection of the earth and all your creation. Make us better stewards of the gift you provide in creation. Make us more mindful of those who are to come after us. God of the new light. Receive our prayer. God who gives new life, bring to yourself all those who have died. Help us to live more fully into the life you promise through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God of the new life. Receive our prayer.
We're going to focus on the epiphany light and specifically recognizing what Christ is doing in the world around us. And we're going to invite people from the community who are doing Jesus work and different things to come and speak. Justice, justice is a process. You know, people don't realize that there are children that uh, actually live on the street. The, the arrest mechanism in law enforcement is absolutely the end um, epiphany result. of recognizing what Christ is up to in our community. morning again, and thank you for being with us. Uh, your, your presence with us makes this time holy, so thank you for that. Um, just a couple of announcements. We are heading into this uh, week, which begins, kicks off the season of Lent. Um, Ash Wednesday will be the official start of Lent. We will have uh, three services that day. Uh, one will be at 8 a.m., and then that service will be rebroadcast at noon and at 6 p.m. So at 8 a.m., noon, and at 6 p.m., uh, you'll be able to participate in Ash Wednesday. If you haven't already, uh, you need to collect a Litton kit or a Litton box. These are at St. Albans and St. Thaddeus. Um, they will help you participate in the Litton worship. So on Ash Wednesday, there is ashes that are um, consecrated and they are in uh, your Litton kit. And you can use those during the service uh, to make the sign of the cross with ashes on your own forehead or on um, the forehead of a family member. Um, also in the box are communion wafers. Uh, those have also been consecrated in the body of the worship. So um, it's important when we bless communion and elements that we do that together. That's not just me up there doing that by myself. It's we do that as a community together. And so um, over the last several weeks, we've included more uh, communion bread uh, in our Eucharist so that we could uh, share those with you uh, via these Linton kits. And we will ask you to, uh, when we do communion, both on Ash Wednesday and on the Sundays in Lent, that you use that wafer to participate in communion with us. So if you haven't received your communion or your Linton box, you can pick that up at St. Albans tomorrow between two and six, or at St. Thaddeus on Tuesday between two and six. And if for some reason you, that time frame doesn't work out for you, um, just give us a call, let us know, we, we will find a way to get a box to you. Uh, stay tuned after the service, we'll have a conversation about um, um, the speaker series uh, that has led us to this point and what we're thinking about that. We'll also look ahead to Easter when we will, um, we will bring the speaker series back and I wanna get some of your ideas about what that might look like. So usually in a normal time, uh, believe it or not, it's been a year since um, since we have stopped worshiping in person. Uh, so Lent marks a year. And when um, the world is functioning normally, we gather and we eat pancakes. That's what we do before, as Abby reminded us in her video, that's what we do before Lent. We eat pancakes. Um, we can't do that this year, and it's regrettable. But the next best thing is this pancake video. <laughs> So the peace of the Lord be always with you and uh, peace in our hearts that next year we will gather for pancakes. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people in your words spoken through the prophets and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the savior and redeemer of the world. And him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. And him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O oh Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ in his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit in the fullness of time. Put all things in subjection under your Christ. Bring us to that heavenly country where with Jude Thaddeus all been in all your saints. We may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Blessed Christ, we believe that you are present in the Holy Eucharist. We continue to grow in love for you above all things, and we desire to receive you. We also desire to be together to share in the sacrament. As we cannot now receive you in Holy Eucharist, we know that you come spiritually into our hearts. We embrace you as if you were already there and unite ourselves to you until we can gather again. Amen. Friends, go forth into the world in peace and be of good courage.
Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen those who are faint-hearted and support folks in need. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Go forth into the world to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for Eucharist today. Lanny says thank you as well. Um, just a reminder that uh, if you stay on the Zoom link, uh, we will be doing an adult forum here very shortly. We're going to focus on the epiphany light and specifically recognizing what Christ is doing in the world around us. And we're going to invite people from the community who are doing Jesus work and different things to come and speak. Justice, justice is a process. You know, people don't realize that there are children that uh, actually live on the street. The, the arrest mechanism in law enforcement is absolutely the end um, epiphany result. of recognizing what Christ is up to in our community.
Change to gallery view using the view control in the upper right. Turn on your video using the video control in the lower left. This will only work if you have a camera on your device. When you're prompted, click the unmute button. 